With the basics of creating classes behind you, we need to focus on some specific issues, like value types versus reference types. We'll need to look at clearing reference variables and disposing of objects. Providing for deterministic finalization, I just like even saying that. Making disposal easier using the using block. Overriding object class functionality. Manipulating object references and different types of class members. So we've got a lot left to cover to complete our discussion of creating classes. Let's start by looking at value types versus reference types. Think about it. Date, time, or integer variables actually contain their data. If you have a variable that is an integer and say it has the value 10, it actually contains the value 10. And these are called value types. If you create a variable of a type that is a class, as we did earlier with the customer2 class, for example, things work differently. Instead of containing the instance of the class, that is, the variable you create doesn't actually contain an instance of the class, that variable contains a reference to the object. These are called reference types. In C or C++, we would say the variable contains a pointer to the object, that is, the memory address. In .NET, even in Windows, things aren't that easy. But it's easy to use that same terminology. That is, a variable that refers to an object contains a pointer to that object. We won't really use that terminology too much. We'll say it contains a reference to the object. It doesn't contain the object. It contains a reference to the object instead. When you create a new reference type variable, its value is the special value nothing. Nothing indicates that we have a reference variable that hasn't yet been assigned to refer to a real instance of an object. You must assign the variable a value before you can use it. If not, you'll raise a runtime exception, and Visual Basic actually even shows you a little squiggly thing under the variable if it hasn't yet been assigned a value. To test to see if a variable refers to anything, you can write code like this. If the variable is not nothing, then you know it refers to something. Or if variable is nothing, then you know it is a null reference. It doesn't point to anything. The is and is not keywords are key here. They're key because they imply that we're working with an object reference. In Visual Basic, the equals operator implies you're working with a value. You use the is and is not operator to indicate you're working with a reference. So if variable equals nothing, that's not correct. If variable is nothing, the is operator indicates a reference comparison. Under the covers, you can imagine the is keyword compares addresses. If the variable, which is an address of an object, is nothing, and nothing is an address, which is a null reference, if they're equal, then we know the variable doesn't contain a reference anything. So the is keyword here indicates that we're comparing addresses, comparing references. To investigate working with null references, I'll choose option D on the menu. This drops us into a procedure where we can try things out. So here's our example. I have cust A here defined as customer, and the customer class in our project is just a copy of the customer2 class all completed. I wanted to make sure I had a version finished so I could write this code without including the original customer2 class. So customer is just a copy of customer2 with a few more little features added that we'll look at later. Customer B we assign as a new customer and we pass a value in its constructor. Okay, I've stepped over that customer construction there. And if cust A is nothing, well, cust A is nothing. And you can even see that there's a squiggly thing here. And the squiggly thing indicates that we're using cust A before it has been assigned a value. A null reference exception could result at runtime. Well, it's a null reference, that's for sure. Here, if cust A is nothing, well, cust A definitely is nothing. So what happens? I step over that and will display in the console window cust A is nothing. OK. How about cust B? Is it nothing? No, it's not nothing. So we won't see anything displayed in the console window. Now I'm going to attempt to set cust A's city property to be Los Angeles. 
Wait, wait, cust A is a null reference. It doesn't actually refer to a customer. It's just a reference to nothing. There is no customer sitting at the other end of that reference. So if I attempt to set the city property to be something, Visual Basic says, wait a second, there's no customer here, forget about it. They're going to raise an exception at that point. And the exception is, if we go look at it, I'll run full speed here. The exception is object reference not set to an instance of an object. Yes, that's true. We never bothered setting cust A to refer to anything. If I look at the code once again, Visual Basic is happy to compile the code with cust A as a null reference, but at least it gives you a warning that you're using a variable that hasn't yet been assigned to a specific object. We have to think about what happens to objects when we're done with them. .NET's garbage collector, and we'll usually call it the GC, is efficient and unobtrusive. And it's this garbage collector that takes care of, well, dead objects. It runs when any managed application is running. And it takes care of reclaiming memory that reference variables use as they create and work with and get rid of objects. You don't need to worry about when objects get removed from memory. The GC, the garbage collector, takes care of getting objects out of memory. Here's the shortest possible explanation of what the garbage collector does. The garbage collector monitors memory that your applications use. As objects are no longer used by your applications, the garbage collector reclaims that memory and in memory marks it as being available for other applications to use. When you're done with an object, sooner or later, and that's the operative phrase here, the garbage collector reclaims the memory. If your computer has lots of memory, the garbage collector may never reclaim the memory. If you have 47 gajillion gigabytes of memory in your computer and you're running applications, it's likely that an object that gets used and then is no longer used will sit there in memory, floating out in space, sort of hooked to nothing, until the garbage collector really needs the memory, and it may never need that memory again. What's important to realize is that the garbage collector can't reclaim memory until there are no more references to an object. That is, you have to release the reference to the object when you're done with it. Of course, when a variable that refers to an object goes out of scope, if it's a variable inside a procedure, for example, when that variable goes out of scope and is no longer being used, well, the reference to the object is no longer being used, and the garbage collector can, at that point, reclaim the memory if it wants to. For local variables, as I mentioned, the reference is removed when the variable goes out of scope. For class level variables, on the other hand, when you're done, nobody knows you're done with it. Because it's a class level variable, it's sort of there forever. In that case, you'll need to set the variable to nothing if you want to indicate to the garbage collector that you're done with the reference. To do that, you could just add my variable equals nothing to your code. And by doing that, you're releasing your reference to the object so that the garbage collector knows that you're done with the object. Now, you don't need to do that if your variable is defined inside a procedure. But if it's a class level variable and you want to indicate that you're done with the object, you'll need to add code like this. When the garbage collector determines that there aren't any references to an object, it reclaims the memory that object was using. At that point, the .NET runtime calls the finalized method in your class to determine any cleanup that you might want to do. So right before it removes it from memory, it calls the finalized method in the code. But your class doesn't have a finalized method, right? You've never seen a class that has one. Well, your class inherits from system.object, which does provide a finalized method. It's a protected method. Protected means that it isn't visible unless you inherit from object. Well, wait, everybody inherits from object. So this isn't a problem. Unless you're using external resources, however, like files, database connections, Windows resources, there's really no point worrying about this stuff. The only reason you have to worry about releasing resources when your object gets destroyed is if you're using some unmanaged object, like a file or a database, or something that isn't under .NET's control. 
At that point, you might need to release a database connection or release some memory used by some Windows object or something that isn't part of .NET, and you would put that code in your finalize method. If you need to release resources for sure when your object is destroyed, well then you need to override the system.objects finalize method and you would put your cleanup code there. I brought up the documentation for the system.object class and you'll see down here, if I look a little farther down under protected methods, there's a finalize method. And this finalize method is the one you should override in your own class if you have code you want to run when your object gets destroyed. Okay, so once we get over the fact that we have to override the finalize method, let's look at an example that does this. Here in our project, there's a class named Stream Demo. Stream Demo is pretty straightforward. This is a class that wraps up a file stream object. It has a private variable as system.io.filestream, and in the constructor you might do something to initialize FS to make it uh, be a real file stream. But if you're going to work with a file stream, then you need to close it when you're done. And nothing's going to make that happen. Imagine what would happen if we didn't have this finalized code. We have this file stream object we're using, it's wrapped up inside this class, and then we are done with the class. We kick it aside. We discard it in the gutter of the memory of our application. We're done with the class. We're not using the object based on that class anymore, yet the file stream is orphaned. It's still out there in memory. The poor file stream. No one has bothered saying, I'm done with you, so it's just hanging out there in memory, wasting a resource. Windows only provides a certain number of file handles, and we're using one here. We need to make sure when this object gets destroyed that its file stream object is also closed. To make that happen, here we check in the finalize override. We say if fs is not nothing, then we close it. We're going to also print something to the console window so we see that we got called. And we also want to call mybase.finalize. It's always a good idea whenever you're overriding any procedure, especially one from the object base class, that when you're done with your code, you call the base version's finalize method or the base version of whatever method you're overriding so you don't give up the functionality that the base class provides. If we didn't call mybase.finalize, then if the object class itself had code in its finalize method, it wouldn't get called. This method is protected here because we're overriding a protected method. You need to use the same keyword. If the original method is protected, this one needs to be protected as well. Okay, well let's look at the code that calls this. I'll press F5 to run and now choose Test finalize E. Okay, so we're going to create a new instance of that stream demo class here. Here we go. There's our constructor being called. And now I'll set my demo equal to nothing. And we sit here. And in the console window, do we see anything being written there? No. Though if the class had been disposed and removed from memory, we'd see something in the console window here, but we don't. I got lots of memory here. The garbage collector hasn't bothered collecting up that object yet. We've released it. We've said, hey, the only reference to that object is gone. You can collect it now, Mr. Garbage Collector, but it hasn't. You can force the garbage collector to do a pass-through collecting garbage if you want by calling the collect method. Generally, this is a bad idea in code because it's slow. It'll suck the life out of your computer if you often call the collect method of the garbage collector. But at this point, I want to force it to find that object and call its finalize method. So here, I'll call the collect method by stepping into it. And now if I go look at the console window, and there we are, finally. Here we have the press any key to continue prompt from our menu system. And also, we have the in finalize coming from the death null of our object. Goodbye, cruel world, it says, and it displays in finalize in the console window. There we go. The timing of that is indeterminate. I had no idea when that would actually happen because I don't know how long that garbage collection actually will take. 
What if your class contains references to resources that must be released as soon as you're done with them? Remember, the garbage collector may not call your finalizer, your destructor, your whatever, for a long time. The fact is that if you're using things like database connections, you may want to release that connection as soon as you're done with the object. To make that happen, you can implement the iDisposable interface in your object. Now, we haven't talked about interfaces yet, and interfaces are a new concept. But basically what happens when you implement an interface, you're agreeing to provide whatever methods that are defined by the interface. And you can look up the interface in the help. It'll tell you exactly what methods you have to have. Implementing an interface is like signing a contract. You agree to certain terms. When you implement an interface, you agree that you'll provide any methods defined by that interface so that code outside your class can call those methods and know that they're there. So when you implement the iDisposable interface, you need to provide a single method named dispose. And you're going to place code here that you want to have run deterministically. That is, when you say it should run. In general, if a class implements iDisposable, callers that use the class know to call the dispose method. And that's a good practice for you to get into. If you use a class and you see that it implements iDisposable, make sure you call the dispose method. It actually doesn't have to be called dispose. Sometimes they call it close and you'll have to investigate the documentation to see. There are actually also tools you can use to do this for you. We'll look at those later in the chapter. But your classes that you create can implement iDisposable and provide a dispose method so that callers that use your class will know to use that dispose method to release any resources you want to let go of. This is only an issue for unmanaged resources, things like database connections, fonts in Windows, files in Windows, things that aren't created by the .NET runtime. It takes a little bit of practice to get used to what those things are, but you'll learn after time what kinds of things you need to release right away. Database connections and files are a perfect example. To demonstrate this, I've added the class to the project name Dispose Demo. If we look at the class, you'll see here at the top that it implements the iDisposable interface. Well, what does that mean again? That means that we'll have to supply a method that implements the dispose method of the interface. Well, let's go look here a second. Let me add here a new class. And in here, have it implement iDisposable. When I implement iDisposable, Visual Studio inserts a bunch of code for me. Now here, this code's a little more complex than what I really want, so I threw this away and wrote my own, and we'll see that. But you can see down here in the dispose method that they wrote for me, it implements iDisposable.dispose. What that means is this method is what the iDisposable interface is looking for. You have to provide a method that implements that method. Now the name of this doesn't matter. So in some cases, people call this close or something like that. All that matters is that it implements the iDisposable.dispose method. So I'll need leave mine as dispose, sort of matching the standard that most people use. Okay, I don't need this class, so I'll just close it down. Back in our example here, we have our dispose method that implements iDisposable.dispose. And what is this going to do? Well, it's important that your dispose method can survive being called multiple times because callers might call your dispose method over and over for whatever reason. So this code has an already disposed variable keeping track of whether or not we've already been disposed. If we've already been disposed, we won't do anything. But if we haven't already been disposed, then if the file stream variable is not nothing, we'll close the file stream. And we'll write to the console window that we're in the dispose method. We also set the already disposed variable to be true, so next time around, we won't run this code. There's no point closing the file stream if it's already closed. In addition, since we've already performed our own finalization, we need to tell the garbage collector not to bother calling the finalize method of this class. There isn't one. We've done whatever finalization we need.
So in that case, to make it happen, we're going to call the garbage collector's suppress finalize method. Suppress finalize says, don't bother attempting to finalize this object I'm already finalized. That'll save some time during garbage collection. So here's a class that demonstrates how disposal works. Let's test it from within our sample project. I'll choose F, test dispose, and let's walk into this. Here we go. We'll create a variable that could refer to a dispose demo object. It doesn't yet. And inside a try block, I'll now attempt to create that dispose demo object and assign it into our variable. This, of course, calls into our constructor and also initializes that already disposed variable to be false. OK. Now we would do some work with the demo variable. But here, we have a finally block. And it says, if the demo variable is not nothing, then let's call that dispose method. Well, duh, it's going to call the dispose method. We'll walk into the dispose method. We're not already disposed. If file stream isn't nothing, unfortunately it is. If it wasn't nothing, it would close it. And now we display on the screen we're in dispose. Great. And you're thinking, well, that's really dopey. I mean, all I have to do is add a dispose method to my class and let people know to call it. Yes, you could do that. The problem is, if you look at our code, this means that somebody has to know enough to call the dispose method. And that is unlikely. Most people see it and say, oh, I don't know what to do with that. I won't bother calling it. Instead, there's some magic that goes on inside Visual Basic. If a user places the reference to your variable in a using block, the using block is a special construct that will dispose of the object for you. And using, the using block, works only with classes that implement iDisposable. So since our dispose demo class implements iDisposable, we can say using demo as new dispose demo. This creates the instance of the object right here. We would do something with demo inside the block when we get to the end using statement that object gets disposed. Now this only works for classes that implement iDisposable. If I try this, using x as string equals hello, well, that can't work. Because x, in this case, is a string, and string doesn't implement iDisposable. Can't work. OK. But demo here is a disposed demo object, and disposed demo does implement iDisposable. Let's run it and see what happens. Let's try g test using. We step into this. We'll create our new instance of the dispose demo class. Here we go. Call the constructor. Set up our already disposed variable. And now we'll do something with that variable. Blah, 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 blah. Do something with it. And here we are at the end of our using block. We're done with that variable. And what happens? Well, it looks to us like nothing. But if we step into the code, we'll see it ends up calling the dispose method. As a matter of fact, if you looked at the IL, I'm done there. If you looked at the IL for that procedure we just looked at, you would see that it explicitly calls the dispose method of that variable demo before the end of the block. They take care of the details for you. On another note, every class you create inherits from system.object. That's the basis of the .NET framework. That's what it's all based on. The object class provides a number of members, and every class you write inherits those members. You've seen that behavior. You can override object class behavior. The toString method is a good example of this. This allows an object to display information about its contents. By default, this returns a string containing the name of the class. Not very useful. You should definitely create your own toString method in every class you create. This makes your class more useful. Let's try it. I'll choose option H right now, which will display the toString method results of an instance of the customer class. So here we go. We'll create a new customer. We'll set the customer name. And now 
I'm going to call the toString method. I never created the toString method. It just magically is there because the object base class provides it. And if I display the results, I get something that's a little uh, underwhelming. Objects and classes dot customer. That's not really what I wanted. I wanted to see something about the specific customer. So to solve the problem, we're going to have to modify our customer class. I'll come in here, and we can add to the customer class an override for the base object class's toString method. So I'll come here, add public overrides function toString. That's the only thing I could override. Here's a list of all the methods from the object base class that I have the option of overriding. So toString is it. And return my base dot two string is what they assume you want. What would that return? Class. It would return objects and classes dot customer. That's not what we want. We want to return something useful. So I'll replace that with return string dot format. Oh, what can we do? How about zero followed by in parentheses one. I need to close that parenthesis. There we go. And pass in the customer ID and the customer name. I just pick something. You can make up your own results. Doesn't matter. Return something that indicates which customer you're talking about. If we try it again, let's save everything, run it, and choose option H again. Nothing changes here. Same old call to two string, but now I see in the output window something that indicates to me exactly which customer we're talking about. It's always a good idea to override that two string method in a class so you have information that's useful when a user calls that two string method. On to a different issue. Reference types are different than value types. That's like saying humans are different than insects. Obviously, for reference types, you must create an instance or be handed an instance by some method call. You have to actually have an object in hand to be able to work with a reference type. What about copying values versus copying references? For a value type, if you copy from one variable to another, you copy the value of the variable. If I have two variables, x and y, each of integer type, if x has 10, if I say y equals x, now y contains 10. Simple. On the other hand, for reference types, copying from one to another copies the reference, not the value contained within the reference. What that means is, if you have two variables that could each refer to the same kind of object, x contains a reference to one of those objects. If I copy from x to y, now y contains a reference to the exact same object. We'll demonstrate that to show how that works. To demonstrate this, I'll try a procedure which demonstrates both copying value types and copying reference types. Let's try option I first, copy a value type. Here we go. I have two variables, int A and int B. Int A contains the value 10, int B well, it doesn't have any value assigned to it. Of course, it has the value 0 in it if we look. And I'll display the current values for int a and int b. And you'll see over here that 1 is 10, 1 is 0. OK. I'm going to copy the value from int a into int b. This reads from right to left. Take the value from int a and place it into int b. OK. Well, what are the values now? Pretty clearly, int b will be 10 and int a is 10, because I copied the value from one place to another. I'm going to change the value in int b to be 15. The question is, does that have any effect on int a? And the answer is, of course not. There are two values, int a and int b, are value types. They have separate locations in memory, and they have two separate values. If we look at the results, int a is 10, but int b is 15, what you'd expect. OK, that's simple. Nothing new there. Let's try it now for a reference type, option J on the menu. We'll come in and create cust A, which is a new customer, and cust B, which is a null reference. It's nothing. All right, we'll set the customer name property of cust A and display the current value in cust A. And it is 
Alfke, Maria Anders. Great. I'll copy from cust A to cust B. Now, what that did was not copy the values. It was just copying the reference. Cust B now refers to the same object that cust A was referring to before. So now, if we have cust B dot customer name equals John Smith, I'm going to change the value in cust B's customer name property. The question is, what did that do to cust A? Well, if it was a value type, it would have done nothing, but it's not. It's a reference type. So modifying cust B's customer name also modified cust A's customer name, as you see here. Cust A and cust B are just two references to the same object. When we copied the reference from A to B, all we did was copy the reference, not the object. There aren't two copies of that customer in memory, just a single copy that both variables refer to. Unless you specify otherwise, members of classes that you create are always instance members. Each member of the class gets its own copy of that member. You can create members that are shared across all instances of your class. The shared keyword that you'll use indicates that the member is associated with all instances, not just one. Properties and fields supply just one copy of the data in memory, and all instances of the class share that variable. For methods, you don't create an instance of the class in order to call the method. The class itself provides the shared method. We'll see examples of doing this. It's important to remember that shared and instance members live in parallel but separate universes. Shared members exist only once in memory and apply to all instances of the class. And instance members can exist multiple times in memory. You have to consider these issues. In our applications, main, the main procedure, is shared. Main can only interact with shared members unless you happen to create an instance of the class. And instance members can always interact with shared members because they're sitting there in memory for anyone to get at. We'll look at examples that demonstrate these behaviors. To demonstrate this behavior, let me select option K, test instance member. In here, I'm going to create two instances of the customer class, cust A and cust B. I'm going to set cust A's customer name property. And of course, by setting cust A's customer name property, I didn't touch anything dealing with cust B, right? Because customer name is an instance property, it has no effect on anything else. So if I display cust A and cust B's information, clearly they're different because customer name is an instance member of the class. Now we can look at shared members instead. Let's go with option L, testing both of them. We'll come in here now, and I'm working with the string class. OK, so here I have a string, and I'll name it value, and it contains the string A, B, C, D, E. OK, if I want to find the index of the letter B within our string, I'd have to actually have a string, value in this case. So I'll call the index of method of the value variable. That's an instance method here. And I can find where the letter B appears within the string. On the other hand, if I want to concatenate together a bunch of strings, I'm going to call the string.concat method. Not the concat method of any specific string, but concat is a shared method of the string class, which means that I just say string.concat to do the work. And that will concatenate together those three strings. And of course, we look at the output. It's pretty much what you'd expect. OK. Well, let's look at a shared property. In our customer3 class, we look at the code for customer3, we have down here a shared property, which is default country. Default country is a property that should apply to all instances of the customer class. So that if someone hasn't yet assigned a customer a country, they'll get this country. You can see the shared keyword. The name is default country. It's got a getter and a setter that return and set the value of this underscore default country variable here. 
Now notice that the variable itself, this private variable, is also marked as shared. Remember I said earlier that shared and instance members live in separate and parallel universes. So if I delete the shared keyword here, I can't refer to default country from within this shared procedure. Because this is an instance member, I can only see it from other instance members. That is, I'd have to have an instance of the class to see this variable. Well, I need it to be able to be seen from a shared member, so it also must be shared. If you remember that shared members live outside the world of instance members, it makes it easier for you to write code. Now, where do we use this default country thing? Up here at the top, we're setting the country backing field to be the value of that default country backing field. Now, remember what I said. You can see shared members from instance members because shared members are always in memory. So here, even though this is shared and this isn't, I can see the shared variable here from my instance code. All right, let's try this. We'll try option M, test shared property. Okay, we step in here and I'll create a new instance of the customer3 class. And right now, what is custA.country? Right now, custA.country was USA, of course. That's the default value for that backing field. I'll set the default country of the customer3 class. Notice it's not a specific customer, but of the class itself. I'll set the default country to be UK. And if I step into that, you'll see I'm setting the default country property of the customer3 class. OK. Now I'll create a new customer3. OK, so what is cust A's country? Cust A's country should still be USA. But cust B's country, because I modified the default country property, should now be instead UK. So before we set anything, cust A's country was USA. After we set the property, cust A was still USA. But cust B got UK because the default country property had been set to UK before we created that new instance of the customer3 class. So go back and review that. It's a little tricky to see the distinction between shared and instance properties in that class. Visual Basic includes one construct that's unlike any other language, and it's here mostly for backwards compatibility. That is modules. Modules are classes in which every member is treated as if it was automatically shared. You can interact with members of a module without ever creating an instance of that module. That's how VB6 worked. In VB6, you never thought about this. You drop code into a module, you could call it from anywhere. When should you use a module? It doesn't make sense for single entities like customer, order, file, and so on. It's useful when you need support procedures or general purpose calculations. That's the case for using a module, where you might want something that anybody can call from any place in your application without having to create an instance of the class. So if you're using entities, things, customer order file, phone call, and so on, that doesn't make any sense as a module. But when you do want support, and procedures that can be called from anywhere, a module is useful. Let's look at an example of where this is actually useful technology. In our sample project, I have a module named Module Demo. And if I look in here, we'll find a couple of procedures. They're just public functions that are general purpose useful things to have in an application where you're working with dates. I have a procedure that calculates the first day in the month and the last day in the month, you send me a date time, I'll pass back the first or last day in the month. How they work doesn't really matter. You can investigate them later. But these are placed in a module named Module Demo. If I look at code that uses these, I'll run our project and choose option N. We'll step in, and now we can retrieve the first day in month. Without creating an instance of the module demo class, we can just call first day in month. Now you can either call it without specifying the name of the module, as I do here, 
or you can even, if you want to make it completely explicit, specify module demo dot last day and month. This is more like when we call string dot format or string dot concat. You specify the name of the module followed by the name of the method. Of course, string isn't a module, but it's the same concept. Remember, under the covers, when you create a module, as I have here, even though we're using the module keyword, it's actually creating a class in which the Visual Basic compiler makes every method in the class be a shared method. That's all it's doing. So here, we're able to call each of these methods without ever creating an instance of the class that they're contained in. This comes pretty much standard in Visual Basic, but it's something that you need to understand that is just using classes in a different way to provide backwards compatibility.